Lord desires to show forth his glory in his creation. And oftentimes when he does so, one, one aspect of that, he starts small, creates the human race, Adam and Eve, together, be fruitful, multiply. Israel, the Hebrews, 12 sons of Jacob, 12 tribes. With the church, well, in redemption of the world, becoming a humble babe, the second person of the Trinity, and then redeeming the world, coming from a humble home in Nazareth. You can still go see it in Loretto, Italy. Just a one little, one little room, basically, is the house, the holy house of the, of the holy family. When our Lord founds the Catholic Church, it's 12 men, 12 sinful men. Okay. One's going to betray him. The first pope is going to deny him three times, but then have a incredible conversion, die crucified upside down. But that's how our Lord tends to do things. He tends to start small. And he wants us to be a part of the work that he does. Yes, our Lord redeemed the whole world on his own. But he didn't choose to come on his own. He took his flesh and blood from our blessed mother. She had to say yes. Joseph was his protector, his defender, his teacher, his nurturer, as his foster father. So we can, at times, um, get a little overwhelmed in our own society and say, how are we possibly going to convert this society to civilization? Well, the church has done it many times. One of the reasons our churches face east is that, well, okay, it's a reminder of the resurrection, the sun's rising from the dead every day, light conquering darkness, as St. John talks about in his gospel. But also the pulpit is normally on the north side. Why? Well, the north was where the, the barbarians were. You're going to take the gospel and convert them. So first, we have the first 300 years of Christianity. The Romans have 10 major persecutions. They're killing the first 32 popes, all killed for the faith. Church continues to grow. Rome is converted. Constantine permits Christianity 313. Rome falls in the late 400s. Then what? You have the barbarians. If you read Pope St. Gregory the Great, he was 590 to 604, if you read what he wrote, he thought the world is over. Our Lord's coming again. This is it with the, with the barbarians. And yet what he did liturgically and with music, Gregorian chant, Gregory, Gregorian chant, it was building for the next few generations, for the next few centuries, actually. And what happened to all those barbarians? They became Catholic. The saints converted them. Our, our society, those the secular writers of history would like to say it's the Dark Ages, you know, after, you know, the 500s all the way up to, you know, Middle Ages, 1100s, 1200s. It was not the Dark Ages. The church was flourishing. The monasteries, St. Patrick, the Irish, were coming to the northern Europe and converting. Okay, these barbarians. What happened to the Vikings? These marauders, these harsh barbarians. What did they do? They came down the rivers and, and of Europe. They slaughtered. They took, the, they took the Christian girls back to be their wives. Then they went out marauding again. And guess who is raising the children? So much for the Vikings, because their children were all Christian. The wives had raised them in their faith. So it's, at times we can get a little overwhelmed and say, well, how are we going to do this? It's always good for us to take a step back and say, I've got where our Lord puts me. I don't, look for, I don't need to look for all the grandiose you know, ways to convert the world. He's got that plan. We just, in our own little way, to be that mustard seed. He wants each of us kind of to, to be that. Wherever he puts us, that, that may be in the family, with my siblings, grown siblings. Could be with my neighbor, just having that time for them. Could be the co-worker, again, having time with them, encouraging them. 
could be the joyful way I go about life and peace. With Many people don't have that because they don't have God. It could be encouraging a friend to come back to confession or just to come to Mass to, you know, just to spend time with the adoration. Okay. There's, there's so many possibilities, right? It could be giving a friend a, a book just to read, you know, when they're suffering or, you know, wondering about is, is it, what's the purpose of life, okay? But we have those answers. And the more the society goes off the rails and doesn't want to hear about God and morality and truth, the more the church starts to shine. And we should be those seeds. If we're not, maybe we're missing those opportunities that our Lord is giving us. He's putting us in different places for a reason. Okay. And that's in our own vocations. That could be single life, married life, consecrated life. You know, t- tomorrow the, our society, which is nice, you know, you know, celebrates fatherhood. And it's, it's interesting because it almost seems a conflict of interest because it seems like in many ways our society has been really going after fathers and husbands and men in general for the last few decades. But when you look at a father, he's, who's, the, who's the greatest, next to Blessed Mother, who's the greatest human person? Jesus is a divine person. He's God. He's another, another level. It's St. Joseph. Our Lord chose, he created St. Joseph to be his own foster father. So next to Blessed Mother, he's the only human person that could call Jesus son. And he did. And the Lord gave him that gift. And the Lord respected his authority. He was the head of the Holy Family. Do we have any words of St. Joseph? Zero. And yet our Lord chose him to be the head of the Holy Family. The silent strength of this man, who's an example for every one of us men, especially husbands and fathers. Don't look to the magazines, the secular. Don't look there to find your vocation, how to live it out. Look to Joseph. He's the one that our Lord chose as the example. But Father, we don't have any of his words. Well, look at the two that he was with during his lifetime. Learn from our Lord and Our Lady how to be that man. Stay close to Blessed Mother. She knows how to, she raised a Christ child with St. Joseph. She helped Joseph to be the saint that he is. No, we as men need need Blessed Mother. And we need St. Joseph. So as a a husband, as a father, what's a father called to do? We basically, the four traits of a father. Call it the masculine genius, if you want to say. The feminine genius is receptive, generous, sensitive, maternal, um, creative. Father, protect, defend, teach, nurture. Protect, yes. Defend. We, we think physically that's pretty much still in our society that's expected. But how about spiritually? If that would have been done over the last 50 years by the men, probably wouldn't be having some of the conversations we're having as far as our society where it's at. Oh, actually, it's, it's spiritual, emotional, psychological, and physical to protect and defend. That's what a husband's called to do, a father's called to do. And sometimes, actually, he may be, um, you know, discouraged from doing so because he's not appreciated in doing that. But that's his role. Okay? He's the protector. He's the defender. That's who he is in his masculinity. Whether our society wants to believe that or not. Okay. But then also to teach and to nurture. So do you know that St. Joseph would have been the one who was responsible, as the Hebrews were responsible, he, he was responsible to teach his son three things. How to pray. That was the role of the father. Of course, the mother is teaching as well, but in a particular way. Teach his son to pray. And then to sing. Because the Hebrews sang the Psalms, the 150 Psalms. So to teach the son how to sing. And then, of course, to teach him his trade, which was carpentry. So he taught, we can't, you know, you got to put quotations around, around that. He taught the son of, you know, Jesus Christ how to be a carpenter. Even though he's God, he knows how to be a carpenter. But Jesus can only learn experientially 
okay, in a sense that as a, as a human, he's never pounded a nail. So that's the only way we can say Jesus learned. He's, he's got the beatific vision in his mind. He, he's God. He knows he's a God. Okay. Right. Right. And then we see protect, defend, teach, nurture. And this is where it gets into the emotional. So sometimes men are really good at pro- protecting, def- providing physically, but spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, dad needs to be present. He's got to be present. Working all the time, is that really the best? Look at how much time Jesus spent with Joseph. They were carpenters. They were with each other all the time as our Lord was being raised. So in our society, it can be a a temptation and get kind of splintered and going here, there, and everywhere. It's like love is spelled T-I-M-E. And so his nurture is, is, to nurture is definitely to spend time with you know, with one's children. So a father, that's what he does. So we ask, you know, St. Joseph, Joseph in a particular way, you know, to help all of our fathers, all of our men, because all, all men are called to be a father. It's either spiritual or physical, huh? Physical, one's own children, could be through adoption. It could be spiritual fatherhood. Okay, the priest are consecrated, but it could also be sp- a single man. And plenty of single men that are really incredible how they, how they uh, helped others. Uh, so we, we ask St. Joseph to, you know, a particular way to intercede for our, our fathers. May Almighty God bless you through the Mac and Heart of Mary.